Well, health information exchanges, I've seen some, some progress. So I'm not as hysterical and upset about it as I was before. I mean, to hear you tell me that, uh, that the secretary, the ONC, uh, Farzad, is actually talking about health information exchange as a verb and not a thing that you buy from Lockheed Martin and each state as one and the hospital puts it in their data center is fabulous. Um, the fact that the uh, Office of the Inspector General uh, gave us permission to do something that was otherwise illegal, which is that uh, we charge the receiver of information uh, the cost that the sender of information incurred by creating the information online. So it's a, in every other industry, it's called a commission or a supply chain fee. In healthcare, it's called a kickback and you go to jail. And now you don't go to jail, you're allowed for $1 worth, only $1. Uh, you think about it, getting cash out of a machine, you exchange three data points and it's 250. The idea of exchanging a chart for $1 is a little crazy, but anyway, it's something. So there's been progress. I still think most of us default into the idea that an exchange is a thing that someone on high holds and that we're all required to send and receive uh, around. And as a result, most of us default uh, to the assumption that we won't use it because we'll, be, we'll use it if we're required to, but we won't sort of be interested in what it has to say because there's no natural impetus for the data to be curated, to be looked over, questioned, adjusted uh, with some use in mind. Um, everyone believes that everything is equal in data in healthcare. And it's not. 99% of it's garbage. It's created for the Greek chorus. You know, it's created for the, the, uh, the malpractice people and the people who, the insurance claim adjusters and the Medicare auditors. And it has nothing to do with your care. And it's totally in the way of the six things that you actually care about. Uh, and that's going on in general, this, this sort of overwhelming entropy of excess data, all of which has to be protected and managed in a totally consistent way. Um, so I, I think there's progress uh, getting health information exchange to be thought of as a verb and to allow the definition of health information to flex and move uh, and be really narrow for some and broader for others. And permission and willingness to say out loud that it should be paid for. All of that is starting to happen, but there's a long way to go. Uh, I think the sixth rule or the fourth rule of user experience design is a totally complicated system cannot be made uncomplicated by user experience. So there's no amount of paint you can put on a pig to make it not a pig, right? The pig in medical record design are the number of constituencies to the information uh, that are required by law be served. So the coding constituency, that you've got to put a bunch of data in there to prove that your visit is a level five visit worth $180 and not a level four visit worth $120, uh, creates totally unnecessary, other than for defending your level fiveness of your visit, data, which then must be protected and secured and exchanged along with the other stuff that people care about. Like, you know, you're redheaded, you know, you got to bring Mikey or I can't go on a date. There's Mikey in the back seat, you know, and you're, it's crazy. Um, so that's one is, is coding. The other one, the other member of the, we call it the Greek chorus, you know, that Athena's got this Greek chorus, she's got to drag around, she goes on a date, she's got to bring the Greek chorus. Uh, another a member of the Greek chorus is malpractice law. So because we have such poor data and such little authorship uh, and flexibility to define what we mean by care that we could then defend, um, we have high malpractice because everything is, counts. Anything that's ever been done by anyone counts as a thing that maybe you should have done. Right? There's been no real uh, sort of surveillance of what works and what doesn't. And so therefore, you have to document in your chart all the things that you checked to make sure it wasn't that. So reams and reams and reams of evidence that you ruled out all kinds of things that you absolutely knew weren't necessary to rule out, but you don't want to get sued. Uh, so that's another constituency. The third one is who's buying it, right? So the intent of the buyer. Because of the ta idiosyncrasy of the tax code, doctors have never accumulated capital. If, if you save profit at the end of the year to reinvest in your business, you have to pay 45% of it in taxes. That's after, before you then pay what's left to yourself as income. So what does every doctor group do at the end of the year, on December 31st? They clean out their bank account, right? And that's been going on since the CAC code was designed that way. Why wouldn't you, right? Mm -hmm. Hospitals, many of which are not profit, other which have assets and balance sheets, retain earnings, can invest in capital. Most people's medical record systems are designed, are, are purchased by hospitals. 
and they have the specific desire of the hospital in, in mind, right? So if you're the hospital, you say, I want to have everything inside here. I want to have the inpatient bed and the colonoscopy and the skilled nursing and the, my own pharmacy, not the CVS pharmacy. I want it all to be in my biosphere. Remember the Texan guy who tried to create his own biosphere and then the ocean went acid and the people inside were fighting each other and all the food died? This is sort of kind of an early stage, dreamy stage of that, all these hospitals are buying, but it's got to have everything on it in one system. I had a CEO of a hospital tell me last week, well, if there was a cloud-based system that did everything that we wanted, uh, we'd buy it. The problem is there's no cloud-based system that does everything. I said, did you hear what you just said? <laughs> You're looking for a system that does everything. By definition, you know, design is about 90% of strategy and 90% of design is about deciding what not to do. So the, the final fourth biggest obstacle is most of the people financing um, the, the, the purchase of these things want everything, uh, want the thing to do everything. There's no interest in separating signal from noise. Um, what we do uh, as, as, as focus on the doctor uh, and that doctor's care team is, you know, we're struggling to go in there and we have to respond to the Greek chorus, but we'd like to respond to it for the doctor. So we'll go demonstrate the evidence of the codes and clock the time in the exam room and do other things. The doctor doesn't have to do it, or we'll have the medical assistant do it, or we'll get the problem list from the patient when they're at home over the website. We'll find ways of wicking away all of that complex scut that the doctor hates and stinks at. By the way, doesn't put it in accurately anyway. If you want to go look for errors, the professor, we just talked about the 50% error rate. If you go into an epic database and pick a record, 50% of the data points aren't quite right. It's not that anybody has malintent. It's just they don't care about it. There's no particular need, urgent need to curate that and make it right. And almost all of it's being put in after the patient's left because you're, by virtue of the demand, always behind. So the, the goal is really a tweet. We, we, we want the doctor to put in not more than 168 characters on any one patient. Because that's what his or her colleagues want to hear about the doctor. Just cut to the chase. I'll look up the labs online. Athene will get all the labs charted. We'll get the drugs picked up, when they're picked up or not, whether they're on them or not. That can be done without the doctor, right? That doesn't have to be entered by the doctor. That can be done really without the patient even in the office, right? Then we'll get to a two-line tweet. And that tweet can be shared with a specialist who can send a two-line tweet back. And now you're having a conversation. And that's the kind of challenge uh, that we're taking on is we'll do the scut work. We'll talk to the Greek choir for you. You don't talk to Caesar. You talk to me, right? And, uh, and then I'll talk to Caesar if it's necessary because I know that Caesar just wants to do that tweet. And that's what patients want. What's wrong with me? Well, I've ruled out 82 things. You know, oh, sh when, when the academic medical centers talk about why consumers can't, won't work, consumer-directed care won't work, well, it's too complicated. They can't know all this stuff. Well, yeah, if you throw in a bunch of garbage and treat it like it's worth knowing, they really won't know it, right? So the goal is to scoop it away, evaluate, is this signal or is this noise? Is this just for the insurance adjuster or other malpractice? If it's noise, bury it. Leave it in the database, memory's cheap, but get it out of the doctor's way so the doctor and the patient and the specialist and the hospital and all the people in that supply chain actually just see the signals and not the noise. Mm -hmm.